Hello there, I'm Maha Siddiqui back here with you to discuss uh, uh, the developing situation in the world and of course uh, the situation in Afghanistan continues to remain in focus. Today, the United Nations Security Council is going to have a discussion on the fast deteriorating situation in Afghanistan. How are they going to be able to help the Afghan government arrest the uh, strikes that Taliban is making? What message will be sent out from that uh, multilateral international platform? All those issues up for discussion here with Praveen Swami. Uh, Praveen, welcome and many thanks. Thank you for having me, Maha. Praveen, first of all, you know, for, for people who've joined us, help us understand how do these discussions work? at the United Nations Security Council, because a lot of people, the general public might get frustrated that while the diplomats sit and discuss issues, things don't seem to change much on the ground. At least that's the sentiment that many of the people in Afghanistan would be going through currently. No, absolutely. As you know, Mahat, the United Nations Security Council is a very complicated beast. So there are five permanent members and a number of members who are there by rotation or non-permanent members. And those five permanent members, any one of them can veto any agreement. Uh, moreover, the United Security Council isn't sort of some uh, uh, sort of like a super government. So there's no UN army or no UN enforcement mechanism other than what the member states themselves agree on. Um, sadly, over the years, we've seen in many, many conflicts um, that the rivalries between or tensions between the members uh, of the P5 have prevented any real agreement. Uh, and even when there has been agreement, uh, the great powers aren't particularly keen to spend their money, uh, risk their soldiers' lives uh, on securing that agreement. Uh, after all, in this particular case, the United Nations, the United States, which is the world's largest power, uh, is leaving Afghanistan behind. Uh, it's obviously understandable that Russia or, say, China would not want to be spending that kind of money or risking their soldiers' lives getting into the middle of, of this kind of situation. Uh, and in country after country, in sub-Saharan Africa, in uh, parts of Latin America, in many parts of Asia, we've seen conflicts drag on because these UN mem uh, sort of member states, permanent uh, members of the Security Council, just aren't willing to act. So then, ultimately, where does it leave the situation in Afghanistan? Currently, uh, you know, Praveen, just uh, a few hours ago, uh, the head of uh, the media department of uh, the Afghan government was killed in Kabul. Taliban has claimed responsibility for that. Taliban are now moving to the urban areas as well. The situation is dire, uh, especially for the women. Many of the women journalists have been particularly targeted. Under these circumstances, uh, clearly the world cannot be a mute spectator. India has initiated a discussion today at the United Nations Security Council because India is a, a president uh, for the this month. But what about the more powerful countries at the United Nations Security Council? What can we expect from them? Can they do some plain talking to, say, Pakistan? That uh, by Afghanistan's allegation is pushing Taliban fighters into their territory. Well, here's the problem. The Americans have known for 20 years that the Taliban were operating from bases in Pakistani territory. Uh, even uh, the Taliban based in Pakistan were attacking and killing American soldiers. Uh, but they chose not to act because ultimately they believed that uh, their interests in Pakistan were more important than their uh, interests in Afghanistan. Uh, there are Ultimately, what is a poor and not very economically important country wasn't as important as a nuclear weapon state, uh, you know, with, with a strategic shadow that, that stretches beyond the region. Uh, and I don't really expect that at this UN discussion, there will be anything very concrete. There will probably be some fine words about how the Taliban need to step in. Uh, in my view, for three reasons, that's not going to happen. Um, and succinctly, those are the first is that the Taliban doesn't really need international recognition. Uh, it makes a lot of money from drugs, from extortion. It's financed itself all these years. It knows Afghanistan's not going to become some, some, some sort of economic hub and superpower. And frankly, they don't really care. Uh, 
Uh, the second reason it's going not going to happen is because the Russians and the Chinese, like the Americans, have interests in Pakistan. They'll push the Pakistanis, but not beyond a point, and the Pakistanis know that. Uh, and the third and probably most important reason it's not going to happen is very sadly the world doesn't care about these things. We've seen refugee crises in which uh, hundreds of thousands of people have been displaced. Uh, we've seen women suffer in many countries in truly horrible ways. Uh, you've reported on some of those crises uh, over the years. Um, and the world usually makes some polite noises. But when there's, there's not money or a compelling national interest involved, uh, the world usually steps back and watches. That shouldn't be how it is, but that is unfortunately the reality. So, Praveen, what role can we expect India to play apart from being able to curate a discussion as we are seeing in the UNSC today because uh, we hold the presidency? We're also in the immediate neighborhood of Afghanistan. India for the last 20 years has taken up development projects, capacity building, training. But there's been sustained pressure on India to have boots on the ground, something that India has resisted. India doesn't want that. That's what right. kind of pressure building will happen on India now? Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, you know, people in and outside Afghanistan, even the United States at one stage had mooted this idea. India has always been hesitant for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of those reasons is, of course, the very ugly experience of what happened in Sri Lanka, where India ended up fighting a very bloody and costly war to no very good end. Uh, a second reason is that India doesn't really have the uh, capacities, the strategic capacities to sustain a large out-of-theater deployment, that is to keep troops where we don't have a guaranteed land or road route uh, uh, to, to resupply them. And thirdly, because it knows that an Indian troop contingent would be a sitting target uh, for the ISI uh, to harass and push, especially when other world powers aren't willing to push uh, the Pakistanis. Um, I don't. I don't think uh, right now there will be much of a conversation on this, especially because the Russians and the Chinese are not interested. Uh, you know, even the Iranians. That is, Afghanistan's next door neighbors are not interested in any uh, peacekeeping role. Uh, probably India will should be, of, in my view, flagging the fact that it's time to think about how we can have some multilateral framework to collectively share the burden, because there are many parts of the world which are ungoverned spaces like this. We've seen that they lead uh, not only to tremendous human suffering, uh, but also to security consequences in the neighborhood and beyond of those countries. Uh, and it's very clear that you know the United States alone or Russia alone cannot be picking up the tab for these things. Um, so it's probably time for India to kick off some conversation on this, not that any miracle will happen and there will be you know, agreement in mm. one meeting about it. But it's definitely something mm. Indian diplomacy could usefully do. Mm. Mm. Also, Praveen, should India be wary of the fact that uh, Taliban is uh, holding talks even with the uh, Chinese leadership? Or is China genuinely concerned of a fallout in their territory? because of the chaos in Afghanistan. And I understand that they are wary of the ETIM group. Is that that's, really that, the case? That's right. Uh, you know, in China's mind, any separatist fear uh, becomes a very large and looming shadow. And sometimes their responses, as we've seen in Xinjiang, aren't proportionate to the challenge. So there's been uh, quite horrible repression uh, now for some time against uh, Muslims in Xinjiang. Uh, having said that, the threat is a real one. There have been uh, some numbers of terrorists from Xinjiang training in Syria. There's been a presence in Afghanistan also. Um, uh, it, you'll recall that the Taliban have been promising repeatedly to kick out foreign terrorists uh, nestled in their ranks. Uh, but they haven't really delivered on those. Even the UN Security Council monitors repeatedly saying... Uh, that Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups continue to be nestled inside the Taliban umbrella. So definitely, yes, something for the Chinese to worry about. The Chinese will probably hope that they can use their clout and, and influence in Pakistan uh, to push the Pakistanis should the need come. You, uh, in 2014, one of the reasons Pakistan uh, began a very bloody war in its own country against 
uh, the sort of Pakistani wing, if you like, though that's a very simplistic way of putting it, of the Taliban, which is called the Tehrike Taliban Pakistan, was because it attacked Chinese. Hmm. And uh, China placed a lot of pressure on the Pakistanis uh, to act. Uh, that led to a very bloody war in which the Pakistani army itself uh, suffered uh, casualties on a large scale. There was a lot of economic damage. And the Pakistanis will probably not be keen to repeat that experience. Uh, but already we've seen there's been attacks on Chinese in Pakistan as the Taliban become more powerful. Um, they're not the only ones worried, of course, the Chinese, the, the Central Asians, the Iranians all have bad experiences of the Taliban. Um, but they're all waiting to see how this plays out. Praveen, do you think it was a mistake on part of the world and especially the United States to have assumed that Taliban is represented by those sitting in Doha and assume that it's a monolith? A very, very interesting question, Maha. I, I wish I had a simple answer to that. Uh, but my personal view on this, and I should tell our viewers that there are many experts and scholars who will disagree with me on this point. Uh, my personal view on this is that the people in Doha are largely, uh, if you like, of a much older generation of the Taliban. Uh, they're people who in their uh, last years aspire to return home to Afghanistan, to ministerial office, to power. But one of the things that has happened in these years is a new generation of Taliban has cropped up, Taliban 2.0, if you like, uh, who are much younger, uh, much more influenced by Al-Qaeda's ideology, uh, much more linked in with drug trade, uh, with uh, extortion, a uh, number of, of these activities. And all of them have their own little empire uh, in various corners of Afghanistan, particularly in, in the south, where there's a lot of revenue from heroin. Now, obviously, it's one thing for a 70-year-old or a 60-year-old in sitting in Doha with their family settled there to say, I would like a negotiated settlement. Uh, but a lot of these younger Taliban see themselves as kings of their uh, little uh, kingdom, their little yes. empire of mud, and uh, really aren't interested in this. Uh, the second thing I, I suspect is within the Pakistan army, there are a lot of people who continue to support the Taliban uh, continue to promise them that they will uh, be, you know, they, that they want to grab total and complete uh, power in Afghanistan uh, and aren't willing to pull the Taliban back. So there's, there's, a, there's a complicated set of factors here which will continue the violence in, in my view. I don't think the Taliban are going to uh, bite. Uh, one of the questions I think a cynic may ask is whether the Americans really care. Um, so, yes, you know, you'll see a lot of noise in uh, America right now over the Taliban's treatment of women. Uh, but America does business with a number of governments whose uh, treatment of women is at least as bad, if not worse. Uh, um, America is not going to be the one picking up the fallout from this. It's going to be the immediate neighborhood, China, Russia, Iran, who are all American adversaries. Uh, so if I was cynical, I would say, you know, why should the Americans really care. Final question, Praveen. Uh, when, uh, you know, countries open channels of talks with Taliban, even India has said that it's talking to all stakeholders. Do you think there is some legitimacy that gets attached to even an extremist uh, organization in some sense that Taliban still remains, even though those who are sitting in Doha might claim otherwise? Well, some people would say yes. And there have been a number of critics who are very, very upset uh, uh, with uh, countries who have spoken to the Taliban, say, saying that, look, uh, you're making terrorists, you're, you're, you're elevating terrorists to the status of a government or a legitimate political actor. Mm. There's truth in that argument. But having said that, uh, through all conflicts in human history, uh, governments have maintained channels to all kinds of people. Uh, India has talked to plenty of people uh, who are secessionists or have carried out acts of terrorism. And some of those are even today in you know, various parts of the country, parts of various governments. Uh, at the height of the Second World War, I mean, this epic, terrible conflict, uh, the Russians and uh, uh, the Soviet Union, I should say, and Nazi Germany, who were bitter allies fighting an existential war, maintained all kinds of secret channels of uh, communication. 
that, that was true right throughout the Cold War, uh, you know, when America and uh, the Soviet Union were mortal allies. So I don't think there is any harm in keeping channels of conversation open, uh, even in times of bloody conflict, if something can come of it. Um, and to explore what is possible, I think India is serving its own best interest by talking to everyone. Uh, I think the mistake sometimes happens because we have excessive optimism about what to expect from the other side. And we think because there is a negotiation, now both sides will settle uh, on some nice, happy uh, halfway house. That isn't true and uh, maybe, maybe sets uh, countries and publics up for disappointment. All right. Thank you, Praveen, for that insightful conversation. And uh, that's it then for the moment. But we'll be catching you again with some more news about the world.